Welcome to Talking Business, a podcast in Melbourne, Australia. The podcast is available on the ACAST site, my own website, the Apple Podcast Store, or wherever you go to get your podcasts. Or you can get it at the Business Acumen website at www.businessacumen.biz. I am Leon Gettler. My job is to review and monitor the week's news in business, finance and economics. I bring it all to you every week. This is episode number 24 in our series for 2022, and today's date is Friday, July the 15th. Today, I'll be talking to Joshua Emblem, Director APAC for Digital Commerce Platform, Commerce Tools. He'll share in detail insights on ways in which e-commerce complements brick-and-mortar stores and why the combined experience is a way of the future as the concept of a store and customer expectations continue to transform. And I'll be talking to Comsec Chief Economist Craig James about the market outlook for the week ahead. But now let's talk to Joshua Implum. Joshua, what are the key incentives for businesses today to invest in building an e-commerce platform complementing their already existing bricks and mortar store? Well, I think there's you know, sort of a, a myriad of reasons there, but I want to touch on a few, a few of those key messages. And you know, research has shown time and time again that consumers are doing their research before they're purchasing online. And that research journey and ultimately the start of the purchase journey happens in the palm of your hand on your mobile device. And if you don't have a rich, authoritative online experience that's engaging, you know, that can demonstrate your value proposition, your product, and ultimately stop the consumer from, you know, picking up the phone in the days of old, and overwhelming your store staff with inquiry, you're going to run into scalability issues in terms of how you meet demands of those customers and what they're looking to get for you from you. So it's really, really important that stores are able to present, yeah, the product, pricing, promotion, inventory availability, delivery methods, and their key value proposition to differentiate themselves from the competition, but also um, customers with as much information as possible about their product before they walk in store. I know I do this myself because I'm in the industry, but you hear this feedback more and more often when you go into a retail store now that... Customers aren't walking in and spending half an hour with a sales associate in the store getting their questions answered. They're more likely walking in with a short list of products. Often it's a short list of one and they've done their research online. They know that product is available in that store and they're going in and saying, can I please have that six kilo washing machine? I know you've got it. And can you organize free delivery for me? Because your website said it could, but I just want to see it and touch it before I ultimately made that purchase. So you can't offer the consumer that type of experience in the store unless you've got you know, a rich, compelling website and that value proposition and all of that information available to the consumer to kick that off. And I think one of the other key reasons for that is competition is becoming more and more fierce in the market. There's more and more pure play retailers who don't have bricks and mortar stores because they don't have the overheads of store staff, of rent, you know, electricity, all those things, they can genuinely offer a better price online than a traditional brick and mortar store can. So if you don't have that online presence, these pure plays are going to come along with a more compelling offer. Yes, you might have to wait a few more days to get your product. Yes, you may not be able to see and touch it. But if you're buying a commodity item or something that you've well researched, then you're going to go to that consumer because our loyalty is eroding. We're seeking convenience over that compelling loyalty proposition. And of course, uh, it has to be mobile friendly. It has to be mobile friendly. More often than not, mobile first. We're seeing a lot of customers reporting back to us that their websites are now getting 80 to 90% of traffic is originating on a mobile device. So there's going to be an entire generation of people who simply skip the desktop, skip the PC, and they will only ever consume the internet uh, through a mobile or a handheld device. Now, what are some emerging tools required for new age bricks and mortar store to elevate customer experience digitally? And how do businesses decide which ones, such as AI or virtual reality or uh, other virtual tools, are best to invest for their optimal outcome to competitive advantage? Yeah, great question, Leo. Look, I think retailers need to look at what it is that they're selling, what type of experience they want to give their customers. Um, There's lots of concepts around, you know, sort of showrooming and web rooming and what that means. I'll start with a few of the ones that you mentioned and you know, artificial intelligence is now everywhere. It is in that mobile device that we just discussed. Google use it at length in terms of just about every single search that you do. They generally know where you are, where you're heading. They can use it to give you traffic recommendations and routing. So I think AI 
Um, artificial intelligence is now just becoming ubiquitous in terms of how we use the internet and the personalization that we come to expect from that. And there's a rich set of tools available from Google uh, that retailers can tap into to get incredible, incredibly powerful and also instant recommendations and results back from Google. When it comes to things like augmented reality and virtual reality, these are fantastic products if you want to purchase something and you want to be able to see it in situ. So a great example is if you're buying glasses online, there's heaps of frames, but you don't know which ones are going to fit your face. You can now activate your camera in your smartphone or in your laptop and start doing a virtual try on from home without even having to go in store and pick up those frames. I'll show you what they look like on your face. On the other end of the scale, people buying furniture can now use virtual reality to begin to place things like couches and coffee tables in their home using augmented reality to get a feel for, you know, will that couch fit? Does it fit the room? Does that color look right against the color scheme of my carpet and the walls? Um, so offering those, the, sort of the rich, compelling experiences to the customer um, to almost sort of virtually try on products that aren't necessarily garments is a great way for businesses to invest in those sorts of tools and ultimately give them that, that competitive advantage that they're looking for. So how do e-commerce platforms and digital visibility enhance customer expectations before they enter the store? E-commerce platforms and that digital visibility is putting the right product, the right price and the right promotion in front of that consumer. And it, coming back to that research phase and that, that purchase journey, the first thing you might search for might be a specific keyword. And if retailers can get their product to the top of that listing, they can put it there with the right price with the notification that says this product is available and in stock. That's genuinely enough for a customer to want to click on that, land on the website, and then start learning more and more um, that they can about the product. You can also back that up with rich and engaging social media presence. As we know, everybody's scrolling these days, everybody's being influenced by people and marketed products that they didn't necessarily think that they wanted in their lives, but all of a sudden they're being put in front of consumers. So I think having you know, a, a rich and robust e-commerce platform that can push the products and the pricing and inventory out there into the market um, is sort of key to increasing your digital vis visibility. And doing that before the customer gets to the store is great because again, they're better qualified, they've done their research, they've got a pretty strong understanding of, of the product that they're looking for. Depending on how good your website is, you might even be able to direct the consumer to where they can find it in store, which aisle on which shelf. And ultimately you're putting convenience back in the hands of the consumer, giving them time back. Um, as we know, everybody's becoming time poor. And so having a website you know, that can offer composable commerce that can pull in all those rich data sources to power that experience um, is going to be key to giving you that that digital visibility. Well, you, what, you, what we're talking about here is walk-in virtual stores, aren't we? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Yep. And I think, you know, there's all the talk of the metaverse and, you know, who knows what is sort of really happening there. Is it going to become a trend or is it just a fad? But if all of a sudden, you know, we're all of a sudden immersed in the aisles or walking around a department store um, you know so much effort goes into some of those luxury brand department stores and if all of a sudden we go back into lockdown or for people who don't necessarily want to leave the home or can't leave the home for any reason they'll still be able to get that sort of that rich and engaging and luxurious shopping experience that we come to expect from some of these department stores and luxury stores as well. Well that would also suggest these uh, retail outlets would actually need enhanced artificial intelligence systems to actually know what their customers are after. Yes, yes, definitely. And you would have seen in the media just this week, there's been a lot of talk around retailers using facial recognition mm. in store and, you know, having the right backend systems in place that can identify the customer, whether they are on your website, on your mobile app or walking around in store and how you're stitching together that information that you're capturing about the customer, whether it is a photo of their face or it is their, you know, um, identity token from having logged in to your store. It's artificial intelligence behind that that can then, you know, power some of those recommendations to put the right product in front of them and ultimately capture more share of wallet. Well, what you're saying is that retailers now just can't afford to ignore these e-commerce offerings. Correct. Correct. It becomes part and parcel now. You must have that compelling online store, it has to be authority, 
you know, it has to have your full product range. It must have pricing. It must have availability. Consumers expect so much from brands and retailers these days that they want everything because they've got it at their fingertips. And if you can't deliver on that, they're going to go looking for it elsewhere. Well, Josh, thank you very much for your time. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Hope that helped. And now let's talk to Comsec Chief Economist, Craig James. Craig, how is the week looking for the July 18th? Well, if it hadn't been for the, the Reserve Bank, we could basically pull up stumps and they'll go on holidays, I think, and because there's not too much in terms of uh, top shelf economic data. Well, there's nothing in terms of top shelf economic data, even second shelf or third shelf, you know, sort of uh, it's hard for press to find anything. But we do have the, the minutes of the last Reserve Bank board meeting coming out on Tuesday. We've also got a speech by the Reserve Bank Deputy Governor coming out on Tuesday. So it starts re- reasonably positively with Reserve Bank and then, yes, it continues that trend on Wednesday when we've got the speech by the Reserve Bank Governor at a business forum in Melbourne. So apart from that, you know, really we're left with the usual weekly consumer confidence reading coming out from ANZ and Royal Morgan coming out on Tuesday. We've got some more detail on skilled vacancies coming out on Wednesday. Some more detail is on the, the job market coming out on Thursday. And then on Friday, we've got the early warning sign or the flash purchasing managers survey coming out from S&P Global. So really the focus over the week it will be on the Reserve Bank. Absolutely. In the, in the press at the moment with raising interest rates. Well, yes, the interest rates going up in a very quick, uh, going up in a hurry is probably the best way to say it. We've had three rate hikes in three months. Uh, 125 basis points, one and a quarter percent has been delivered in terms of rate hikes. In fact, the, the last two months, 50 basis points were half one percent in the last two months. And that's really the most aggressive that the Reserve Bank has been in uh, since they started targeting the, the cash rate uh, back in 1990. So certainly they're trying to get to the, the preferred levels. We don't know what those that preferred level is for the cash rate, but they want to get to a a more preferable level for, for the cash rate, which is uh, in line with how well the Australian economy is p- p- performing. So certainly when we look at those speeches by the Reserve Bank Deputy Governor and the Governor, if they do take questions and answers, and no doubt they will, one of the hot topics will be, well, you told us last month that the rate hike was going to be 25 or 50 basis points. Have you got similar sort of guidance for, for this month? It will be interesting to hear the, the response. What the Reserve Bank has been ruling out is the more aggressive rate hikes like that were seen in the United States of 75 basis points. But certainly we have seen, yes, still, still quite aggressive move by the Reserve Bank over the last two months for 50 basis points. But we, everyone wants a degree of guidance. Everyone wants a little bit more information. And the US Federal Reserve is certainly supplying a lot of information to investors in the United States. We want to see the same thing happen here in Australia. The big issue is what happening with inflation. And so does that show any signs of abating at all? It's got some signs of starting to top out, but you know, so we can't be you know, sort of too hard and fast on these things. I think one of the, the best guides that we've got in terms of inflation is what's happening in terms of the oil market. So that I think is something that to, to, to be watched fairly carefully. What the central banks are trying to do right the way across the, the globe is to get supply and demand back into balance. So we, we do, do know that we've got the COVID problems and that's causing supply chain difficulties right the way across, across the globe. And what central banks are trying to do is slow down demand to, to meet up with that uh, reduced amount of supply coming coming forward. And, and then, yes, yeah, so some of the inflationary pressures will, will be tempered. But um, one of the big things in terms of uh, prices moving, yes, yeah, so certainly moving on the upside over the last couple of years has been the oil price. And of course, that feeds into everything, feeds into transport, feeds into distribution, feeds into work uh, in, in all manners, you know, sort of across economies. And we see the oil price coming down then uh, we've got a more confidence that we're going to see a starting to see an easing of inflationary pressures. I think that's the thing to watch. It does move around the place for some time. And the aggressive rate hikes that we've seen to, to date have served to um, uh, suggest that uh, we are going to see a slowdown in terms of the global economy. And if you have a slowdown in general economic activity, of course, you've got to slow down in oil demand. Well, the big issue, though, is 
are we facing a recession? And you know, all the economists, I mean, economists like Nouria Rabini are saying recession is coming in the US. And, uh, you know, that will, and of course, uh, uh, Naruma brokerage firm said uh, that Australia was heading for a recession as well. Uh, so what's your view about that? Uh, in Australia, I think it's very unlikely that we'll go into recession because we've got so much momentum. If you look at consumer spending, the, the latest figure on consumer spending shows that sales are up over 10% compared with uh, 12 months ago. So Aussie consumers are a little bit anxious. Consumer confidence is a little bit on the soft side. But if people have got jobs and wages are continuing to, to rise, uh, then you uh, do have stronger retail spending. And well, that's what we're seeing in terms of retail spending. If you look at uh, the housing market in terms of building activity, it's not just homes, it's uh, renovations, it's commercial developments, it's engineering construction. We're seeing uh, lots of activity you know, so there as well. We have got that job market, which is in very, very tight shape at the moment. And we've got uh, skilled vacancies at the highest levels on some measures, the highest levels ever recorded and uh, in others, you know, so the highest in 14 years. But um, uh, certainly our economy retains pretty good, you know, some momentum. We don't have the same sort of inflationary pressures in other parts of the world like the US and UK. So we don't need to be as aggressive in terms of slowing down our economy. Um, as for the United States, there is a, certainly a possibility that they could go into recession in the United States and recession defined as two consecutive quarters where the economy goes backwards. So there is the risk of that in the, in the United States. They're not as in good shape as we are here in Australia. But um, I think it will be a short, sharp recession if it does happen, uh, because in, in a fundamental sense, US companies and companies around the world at the moment are in generally good shape in terms of revenue and profitability. The, I mean, but the issue too is that with the RBA raising rate, house prices are coming down very fast. And, uh, you know, property prices are coming down. That will affect people's wealth. Yeah, no, it's certainly the, the correct answer yeah, so that um, interest rates going up is softening the housing market. And I suppose, again, that's another one of the desired effects. Why do you put up interest rates? Well, you put up interest rates to get back to more normal levels for an economy that's functioning you know, sort of more normally, but you're also trying to slow things down a bit. And when you've got uh, home prices increasing at a rate around about 20 odd percent, clearly that's not sustainable and you'd like to see that come down back to, to normal levels. Of course, when you've got interest rates going up and home prices are softening, that's bad news, of course, if you're paying off your, your home or you own your home outright, but if you're trying to get into the market, that's actually quite a positive thing. And we think about savers at the moment, think about renters, people trying to get into the housing market. If home prices are soften and uh, saving rates going up, well, that's basically a double whammy that will help people, particularly first home buyers, get back into the, the market. So there is a positive, positive angle or a positive slant that we can put on the fact that home prices are softening. Now, Craig, the $64 question finally is, I mean, the market is pricing now, uh, that we're going to have a 3.5% interest rate or uh, cash rate uh, by the middle of next year. What's your view? Well, it's certainly not our view. We think that because Australian uh, home, home buyers and Australian consumers more generally have taken on a lot of debt over the last 12 to 18 months, that uh, they'll be much more sensitive to uh, interest rate hikes. Now, certainly when you look back over the last 12 to 18 months, Aussie consumers have had really nowhere to go. They uh, haven't been able to travel overseas. So what they've uh, done is left a lot of money in the bank. They've paid off you know, their home loans or paid down their home loans. So they've got themselves in pretty good shape. So the first couple of interest rate hikes, I don't think have really touched the side. It's just more across a shot across the bow, uh, indicating the, the fact that you know, interest rates are going up and going up to, to, to more normal levels and getting people you know, sort of prepared for, for that. But um, I think once we get up to a cash rate a bit over 2%, and we're looking for the cash rate to peak somewhere in the order of 2.1%, perhaps 2.35%, getting up to those levels later this year, we think that's where, where the Reserve Bank will stop, will assess the situation and determine, OK, let's see what happens to inflation now when we've got interest rates at a bit over 2%. If, if that still doesn't stem the inflationary pressures, they may have to go further. But we think that 2.1%, 2.35%, that sort of level of the cash rate will be the, the peak level for, for later this year. In fact, what we're tipping 
in a bit over uh, around about 18 months time in the December quarter of 2023. And we think that interest rates will actually be coming down at that point, that um, the rate hikes serving their purpose, slowing down the economy, getting inflation back into the target band, and the, the fact that the Reserve Bank will be in a position to be able to cut rates there. So it's going to be a fascinating, yes, the next 12 to 18 months as uh, we work through the process of getting interest rates back up to normal levels and then determining where they should actually be finishing. Well, Craig, that's all quite illuminating. And thank you very much for your time. Not a problem at all, Leon. What's happening in the news? Well, recession risks for the US and Eurozone are increasing, according to economists at UBS. The average of US recession probability models monitored by UBS has spiked to 40% from 12% in late May, with its hard data model at 96%. The Eurozone is also starting to flash red in terms of soft data on survey-based models. US economic data really fell off a cliff in May as the UBS model of 60 60 variables went from 8 in negative territory in April to 12 in May. The weakness broadened from housing to everything that's affected by real disposable income, which has suffered from soaring inflation. July employment data appeared strong, but the detail was a lot weaker. And a global squeeze on energy supply that's triggered crippling shortages and sent power and fuel prices surging may get worse, according to the head of the International Energy Agency. The world has never witnessed such a major energy crisis in terms of its depth and and its complexity, IEA Executive Director Faith Birol said Tuesday at a global energy forum in Sydney. We might not have seen the worst of it yet. This is affecting the entire world. Dr Birol compared the current situation in global energy to the 1970s when twin oil supply shocks hit hard and triggered a global recession. The whole energy system is in turmoil following the February invasion of Ukraine by Russia, at the time the biggest oil and natural gas exporter and a major player in commodities, Birol said. Soaring prices are lifting the cost of filling gas tanks, heating homes and powering industry across the globe, adding to inflationary pressures and leading to deadly process. Like the oil crisis of the 1970s, which prompted huge gains in oil fuel efficiency and a boom in nuclear power, the world may see faster adoption of government policies that speed the transition to cleaner energy, Birol said. In the meantime, security of oil and gas supplies will continue to pose a challenge for Europe and also for other regions, he said. This winter in Europe will be very difficult, Birol said. This is a major concern and this may have serious implications for the global economy. Birol's comments come as the east coast of Australia is gripped by a sustained energy supply crunch, which has driven up wholesale electricity and gas prices to record levels, hammering industrial customers and households. The crisis has been driven by a wave of outages at coal-fired power stations in the national electricity market, high international prices for coal and gas exacerbated by the war in Ukraine, and heightened demand for energy amid cold winter weather, just when the contribution of solar power is at its weakest. And former Formula One supremo Bernie Eccleston has been charged with fraud over a failure to declare more than £400 million at $706 million of overseas assets to the British Tax Authority, prosecutors said on Monday. The Crown Prosecution Service said Eccleston, 91, faced one count of fraud by false representation. The first hearing in his case is due to be held on August 22nd at London's Westminster Magistrates Court. And Australian consumer confidence is tracking at its lowest level since the early 1990s recession, excluding the sharp coronavirus downturn in early 2020. The prospect of further interest rate rises and house price falls has smashed consumer confidence, which is nearing the pandemic lows seen during the initial lockdowns of March, April 2020. Westpac and the Melbourne Institute's long-running and widely watched consumer sentiment index dropped another 3% to 83.8, well below the 100-point level that indicates when, it, when optimists equal pessimists. The weekly ANZ Roy Moore Consumer Confidence Index has been released, with confidence pledging another 2.5% amid concerns over the economic outlook and household finances following last week's 0.5% rate hike by the Reserve Bank. Labor and input costs hit fresh records in the latest NAB monthly business survey, while corporate sector confidence slumped below the long-run average despite strong business conditions and forward orders. Consumer confidence declined for a second consecutive week, falling sharply in New South Wales, Victoria and Queensland. The falls were driven by concerns about both the economic outlook and household finances amid rising interest rates. Confidence among mortgage holders has fallen 25%, since just before the Reserve Bank of Australia moved to inflation-fighting footing in May, when it increased the cash rate for the first time in a decade. Reflecting near-record high petrol prices, consumer inflation expectations hit a near-record high 6%. And Australia has signed a new technology partnership with the United States and joined an international alliance to secure global supply of critical minerals as Western nations ramp up efforts to cut carbon emissions and wean themselves off volatile oil and gas markets. 
US Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm in, in Australia for the first time told the Sydney Energy Forum before the signing of the landmark deals that the two countries face common challenges to turn from being fossil fuel exporters into clean energy powerhouses. Federal Climate Change and Energy Minister Chris Bowen said, in contrast to the long-standing message that climate policy posed risks to growth and jobs in Australia, action on climate change was both in the country's own economic interests and in the environmental interests of the planet. And employers are bracing for record sick leave over the next month, with absences already running at 50% above average levels as a highly contagious BA.4 and BA.5 variants drive a new wave of infections and hospitalisation. Sick leave from fever and cough is already five times last year's levels, with the latest flu tracking data showing 2.25% of people off work from sickness compared with a five-year average of 1.5%. The data tracks people sick from respiratory illness, such as influenza and COVID-19. And data from the workplace software platform Deputy shows much higher absences in the aged care and retail sectors over June. More than a third, 36.8% of aged care shifts went unfilled in New South Wales in the month. The national rate for aged care was 14.5%. 7% of retail shifts went unfilled with the highest rates present in Western Australia, 9.8%, and New South Wales, 8.1%. Worker absences typically peak in August, but health authorities expect the combination of late-season influenza B cases and rising COVID-19 infections to cause record-taking of sick and carers' leave. Hospital emissions have leaked by more than 1,000 in the past 10 days to 4,000, with emissions forecast to rise across the country to well above 5,000. Australia's Chief Health Officer said to communicate on Friday that the effect would be similar to January's BA.1 wave without further public health action. The chief health officers warned BA.4 and BA.5 are associated with increased immune escape, and so new cases among, among those previously infected with an earlier COVID-19 variant are likely. As well, reinfections may occur as early as 28 days after recovery. And employers are calling for an urgent ramp-up of skilled migrants as a priority fix at Labor's job summit in September, as unions warn they will fight for more safeguards to ensure temporary visa workers are not exploited. Quick wins sought by business include a temporary two-year increase in skilled migration to 200,000 places a year and making temporary skilled migration more accessible and responsive to employer needs by scrapping the so-called targeted occupation eligibility list. An overhaul of the migration system is, is emerging as a headline issue at the summit, with changes likely in the, in the October budget. Prime Minister Anthony Albanese and Treasurer Jim Chalmers said the summit would help drive reforms in participation, productivity, migration and women's economic security. And Ramsey Healthcare, a $16 billion ASEX listed health giant, has begun moving its mental health services outside hospitals and into the community, opening 11 psychology clinics across Australia with plans to establish 20 more in the, in the next two years. It is a model Ramsey has adopted across its Swedish operations and comes as demand for mental health services is soaring during the pandemic. 200 psychologists running Ramsey's Australian clinics have completed about 10,000 consultations the past year. The community clinics have helped keep Ramsey's 1,100 mental health hospital beds for those who are acutely unwell. Ramsey hopes it can partner with state governments to ease chronic shortages across the public system. The community clinics offer more than counselling services, providing treatment for all mental health concerns, including those associated with mood, anxiety and substance misuse, eating disorders and PTSD, as well as psychometric testing for cognitive impairment, attention deficit disorder and other behavioural problems. It comes after Ramsey, which is subject to a $20 billion takeover from global private equity firm KKR, launched a $3 million public-private partnership with the New South Wales government to provide more mental health services to adolescents and young adults late last year. And a probe has been launched into Bunnings and Kmart's Australia's use of facial recognition after an investigation exposed those retailers using the controversial technology. The Office of the Australian Information Commissioner, OAIC has opened an investigation into the use of the technology on customers by the two retailers, which are both owned by West Farmers. Bunnings in Kmart, as well as the good guys, were referred to the body by the consumer group Choice two weeks ago for potential breaches of the Privacy Act. Choice had found all three retailers to be analysing CCTV footage to create profiles or face prints of those customers without consent. The OIIC added it to commence preliminary inquiries with the good guys, which paused its use of facial recognition technology in the wake of the expose. And the price of food has continued to rise, with new data showing that every supermarket aisle has been hit by hikes, not just fruit and vegetables. The soaring prices have led researchers to call on the federal government to help subsidise growers amid concerns it's costing some lower socioeconomic families 40% of their income to buy a week's worth of healthy food. 
Comparing the cost of 28 staples between June 2020 and June 2022, researchers from Deakin University's Institute for Health Transformation found the price of lettuce and broccoli had the biggest jump, increasing by more than 100% within two years. In 2020, a head of lettuce would have cost $2.50, but now costs more than $5, and broccoli jumped from $5.90 to $11.90 a kilogram. Tomato saw the third highest jump, going from $6.90 to $9.90 a kilogram over two years. But it wasn't just fruit and vegetables, with Christina Zorbis, a researcher at Deakin University, calling the increase a crisis. The recent floods in New South Wales and Queensland, coupled with the increase in the cost of fuel due to the war in Ukraine, have meant almost everything is more expensive at the moment. And National Australia Bank has rejected allegations from its former head of repo trading that she was harassed and bullied in her job, calling for the federal court to throw out her application. Dicola Duara has alleged she was subjected to a boys club culture in NAB's trading team, claiming she was underpaid and threatened with a baseball bat. NAB disputes this, claiming the baseball bat was a souvenir and denied her allegations the trading key team was overwhelmingly male. NAB admits approximately 90 to 94% of those working on the Sydney trading desk were male. And an English appeals court has given 200,000 plus Brazilian litigants the green light to pursue their £5 billion, that's $8.8 billion class action against BHP over the 2015 Samarco Dam disaster. The long-running courtroom saga can now go to a full trial after class action law firm PGMBM on Friday succeeded in getting the Court of Appeal to overturn BHP's initial victory in March last year. In November 2020, a lower court vetoed the lawsuit, ruling that the huge class action would be too complex and costly and might duplicate litigation efforts in, in Brazil. The claimants then lost an appeal against that decision last month, which seemed to kill off the case. But last month, they won an exceptional appeal hearing to reconsider that verdict. The ruling in their favour was handed down on Friday. The judges said the court case should proceed because the remedies on offer in Brazil were not so obviously adequate that it can be said to be pointless and wasteful to pursue proceedings in England. The collapse of the Fandauer Iron Ore Tailings Dam in 2015 killed 19 people and left hundreds homeless, as well as wreaking environmental and infrastructure damage that extended across two states. Within weeks, a Brazilian class action was launched that ultimately won a settlement of 20 billion Brazilian reals. In a statement, PGMBM said BHP will now finally face their decade or day of reckoning in the English courts and will have to account for their role in the 2015 disaster. The litigants say they had to turn to the English legal system because they're getting only slow and inadequate redress through the Brazilian courts, where a second 155 billion real lawsuit is underway, and from the Renova Foundation. BHP still has the option to try to prevent the trial by appealing against Friday's decision to the Supreme Court. A spokesman said the company was considering its response. And mobile phone companies face up to $250,000 in fines if they fail to comply with a new code to block SMS scam messages. Pro mobile providers will be required to identify, trace and block text message scams, share information about scam messages with other providers and report scams to the authorities. Australian Communication and Media Authority Chair Nerida Lachlan said the new rules should have a similar impact as a 2021 code to eliminate scam phone calls. The Australian Competition Consumer Commission's annual scam report released last week found the call code had led to a 50% drop in complaints about scam calls in 2022, but the gap had been filled by SMS scams. SMS scans accounted for 32% of all reported scams this year to date, accounting for $6.5 million in losses compared to $2.3 million in the same period last year. Scams across all mediums are increasingly targeting vulnerable sections of the community. Scammers sold $66 million from Indigenous Australians, people with a disability and culturally diverse communities in 2021, almost double the amount taken in 2020. And the nation's major airlines are on track to record one of the worst on-time performances on record after more than half of all domestic flights last week were delayed or cancelled. From Monday to Sunday, Qantas cancelled 6.7% of domestic flights and had an on-time performance of 44%, while Virgin Australia cancelled 14.7% of flights and had an on-time performance of 43%, according to figures privately compiled by the airlines. The growing delays during a busy holiday period with both Qantas Chief Executive Alan Joyce and Virgin Managing Director Jane Hirilaka in Europe have been compounded by illness, not only among airline staff, but also air traffic control. Air Services Australia confirmed on Monday that 10% of the air traffic control team were absent during the past week, but did not say whether the shortages were most acute. Wild weather had also exacerbated delays with Sydney Airport operating only one of, only one of three runways on Friday, fog slowing arrivals in, into Melbourne. Official on-time performance figures are not released until late July. 
Bureau of Infrastructure Transport Research Economics data for the May showed an average on-time performance of Qantas of 60.7% and a cancellation rate of 7.1%. Virgin had an on-time rate of 65.7% and a cancellation rate of 5%. During the COVID-19 pandemic, Qantas cut 9,400 jobs and Virgin, which fell into bankruptcy, cut 3,000 jobs. Both airlines have been racing to restart as demand for travel has rebounded. Qantas has recruited 1,000 people since Easter. And the famed Dunk Island is poised for a reboot as a major Queensland resort after the dilapidated property sold to Atlassian Chief Executive Mike Cannon-Brooks for about $25 million. The low-profile deal comes in the wake of a failed bid by Upsense Cap Media Capital to buy the property and turn it around in the wake of a failed scheme by property funds house Mayfair to transform it into $1.5 billion tourism mecca. The latest owner is likely to come up with a more manageable plan to resuscitate the island as domestic tourism booms, prompts rises in room rates as packed flights again head to local resorts. Cannon Brooks, the founder of software giant Atlassian and minority owner of the Utah Jazz basketball team, has put together a series of high-profile properties, although the island resort is a departure for him. His purchases include a luxury, sprawling manor, Wattle Ridge in New South Wales Southern Highlands, and he has also been linked to a sandstone heritage cottage in Scotland Island on Sydney's northern beaches. The portfolio also includes a beachside home at Coasters Retreat at Pitwater. In 2018, the tech billionaire and his wife Annie bought Australia's most expensive house, Fairwater, in Sydney's Point Piper for about $100 million, ending more than a century of Fairfax family ownership. And that's it for this week. And next week I'll be talking to Grant Case, the Regional Vice President for APAC of Data IQ, the centralised data platform that moves businesses along their data journey from analytics at scale to enterprise AI. And I'll be talking to Indeed economist Callum Pickering about the latest jobs figures. In the meantime, you can catch me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn and YouTube. And if you want, leave a comment. Wishing you all a safe and healthy day.